to welcome to the set Miss Cassie Cook, who is the treasurer of the San Francisco branch of the NAACP. She is also the event manager and the event co-chair. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. So you've been a busy lady. I've been a very busy lady, and we have been very successful this year. We have like, we sold out. Awesome. We have Eight, over, how, how many? Over a thousand people. Awesome. Over and a thousand this, people. Yes, yes. This is the plateau since I've been uh, working the events. Absolutely. And That's I've been great. doing this for about 11 years now. Awesome. That's awesome. So, could you tell me, how long has it does it take you to plan an event of this magnitude? So, when did you guys start planning this event? I started, I started in August. Mm -hmm. Up until last night. Up until <laughs> <laughs> so you started uh, August up until last night. So this is your 96th anniversary. This is the 96th anniversary. Yes. That is amazing. So you guys have been, have you been doing this event for 96 years? Or no. Uh, the San Francisco branch has is been in existence for 96 years. No, they have been the they have been doing the Freedom Fund Gala for 96 years. Okay, so you have. You've been doing this event for, that is amazing. I have not. Well, okay, of course. I, I, I have of only course. been doing this <laughs> event for 11 years. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yes, yeah, like you just like let me clear that up. <laughs> she has not been doing this event for 96 years, but it has been in existence for 96 years, which is amazing. You're exactly so, correct. Awesome. So for an event like this, a, a thousand people, what few? What do you feel? Few the ticket sales or the momentum? Do you think it's the political climate? or perhaps you guys have some amazing guest speakers that are going to be here tonight, or is it a combination? It's a combination. It's the political climate. Uh, it's women working together with women. Mm -hmm. And it's by association. Awesome. And, uh, and our sponsors as well. Our sponsors is the reason that we are able to do this. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for doing this event. And if you could just tell the viewers, because the proceeds from this event obviously is money that goes back into your programming, right? Yes. So if you could just share what some of that is. Okay. In NAACP branches of 501C4s, which we cannot, we are not like a C3 nonprofit, C4s, you have to raise your own monies. And when we have this event, this event allows us to operate for the next year. This is the only funding that we get from this event to operate for a whole year. Awesome, that's awesome. So thank you so much. I know it's gonna be a fabulous event. I'm looking forward to it. Me thank too, you. I'm excited. Thank you, have a great evening. I have the pleasure of sitting down with Congresswoman Maxine Waters, and I'm excited to welcome you to the set of Real Talk with Terry. Con yes. Thank you. Uh -huh. Congressman Waters, there's an unprecedented number of women headed to Congress in January, and you have a long history of public service, and could you just share with the viewers what motivated you to dedicate so much of your career to public service? Oh my goodness. Um, I have been involved since high school, awesome. uh, one way or the other, in public service and working in the community. Um, I always had active roles all of my life, and I was involved very much with the War on Poverty mm -hmm. uh, that helped to bring resources into our communities that had been absent, such as Head Start and other kinds of programs. And of course, I think uh, there was a defining moment uh, when I was basically drafted uh, to run for office at the height of the women's movement mm -hmm. many years ago. <laughs> and since that time, I've served in the California State Assembly and of course in Congress, and um, that has been my life. Awesome, thank you. And you have a proven track record of success, particularly following the civil unrest in LA in 1992. And as a result, you founded Community Build. What sort of projects are you currently working on? Well, as you know, uh, since we have taken back the House in the midterm Yay. elections, I have the great possibility of being the chair yes. of the Financial Services Committee. Awesome. And that committee has a responsibility uh, for all of the banks, mm -hmm. all of Wall Street, the awesome. insurance companies, and of course we have HUD, uh, the International Monetary Fund, 
on and on and on. So we have a lot of issues to deal with. I'm going to focus on homelessness. Awesome. Uh, we have a, a crisis in this country. Absolutely. And we need affordable housing. I'm going to focus on consumer protection. We have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, that we created under the Dodd-Frank reforms. And of course, this administration have been undermining all of that work. And I'm going to work to restore that. Uh, I'm going to work on making sure that we have a national flood insurance program awesome. uh, that is affordable awesome. and that we don't have the high premiums that people can't afford. I'm going to be working on uh, with my other colleagues on infrastructure, even though it's not directly in that committee. I think we all have to weigh in on what we can do uh, to deal with our water system uh, in this country, our bridges, roads, highways, and our streets. So we have a lot of work yes, to do. Yes, we have a lot yes. of work. Yes. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. And my last question, I read somewhere that a wild card or an X factor in politics right now are the millennials. Yes. And that um, not just, although the millennials prefer the Democratic Party over the Republican yes. Party, that we're losing, the Democratic Party is losing millennials. What can the Democratic Party do to change this phenomenon? Well, I don't know that we're absolutely losing millennials, but I do know that many millennials have thought that both parties were the same, mm -hmm. that it didn't make any difference who you voted for. I think since they've seen Donald Trump, uh, that they see that there is a difference, because none of us have ever seen anything like him before. Uh, and I think that uh, they're beginning uh, not only to vote for Democrats, but they're looking for authenticity. And they're looking for individuals who will speak truth to power. Absolutely. And who will absolutely deal with those issues that are on their hearts and their minds. And I think they're moving in our direction. And I think when we analyze what has happened in the midterms, we're going to see that. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so You're much welcome. for sitting down with us. You're welcome. I'm, I'm excited about January. You, and good luck. Thank you. We are rooting for you. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Kenneth Montero, one of the honorees for tonight's program. And Dr. Montero, I want you to discuss more, and I'm going to read this because I don't want to mess it up, but I want you to talk to the viewers and just share with me more about the false education that opens people up to discredit humanity. And first of all, before you discuss that, I just want the viewers to know that you are a 37-year career faculty member Member yes. in higher education and if you could just give us a little bit more tell us a little bit more about your background and what you've done that would be awesome I've been teaching for 37 years in public higher education most of it at San Francisco State University so awesome. I'm really committed to highly accessible affordable relevant education meaning learning big ideas being able to do something important in your community when you leave your education, awesome. so that's uh, that's part of it. But the uh, the point that you, we, we were talking about earlier, yes. before we came on the screen, is that ignorance is one of the big manipulative tools of powerful people who want to create pain for other people. Mm. Self knowledge and other knowledge are what our knowledge hinges on. So if you can convince me I'm not who I really am, Absolutely. I become insecure, you can keep me terrified. Wow. If I, if you can also convince me that you're not who you are, a wonderful human being, then someone convinced me to hurt you. But as neighbors, if I, if we know ourselves, we will hold ourselves differently. And if we know each other, there's no way you're going to get me to hate you. Now, I might get a little irritated of what's happening at the fence or what have you, Absolutely. but I won't hate you because I know your humanity, I know your history, I know your people's history, and you know, and, and if someone tries to call you outside of your name or, or, or imply that you're something else, you can stop them immediately and say, no, I know who my people are, I know where they came from, I know what we've contributed. Absolutely. And so each of us will uh, to act as equals and we will equal act more kindly but if I'm afraid people lash out when they're afraid Absolutely. and if I think you're not you're less than human I can do things to you that I would never do to another human being Absolutely. and it's important because right now people are misusing see, it's not that they're not educating people they're badly educating people in order to manipulate people poor people of color and poor white people have more in common than they do with very, very powerful people who are manipulating the world who are telling them, oh no, 
that's the person who took your job. Well, the person who walks, works right beside you can't take your job. Absolutely. That person can't move a fa factory. That person cannot cannot mess with your mortgage. They can't do that. Right. But somehow, if you don't know and you're fearful, you can be convinced of those sorts of things. And then someone will, instead of saying that they're misinforming you, they'll make up a word that actually sounds like something you want. Alternative facts. <laughs> the alternative to a fact is a lie. Absolutely. And there's no in-between. No, either, there really is. It's either the truth or it's a lie. There's yeah. no in-between. And how can, we, um, how can we overcome this? Is this just something that we need to be aware of as a society, or how do we how do we overcome this phenomenon? Well, I was for 12 years the dean of the College of Ethnic Studies, and I'm just stepping down. It's not just to pitch them. We actually have independent researchers who've shown that our students of all colors, one, they find it valuable, two, they not only learn about themselves, they learn how to make their education relevant to them and their families, three, they learn to respect other folks because they have to learn about other people's value in life. Right. And so, little side effects, we have the evidence that it increases their grades in K-12 through when they take our classes. And I'll give you a sense of how big the deal is. At the university, succeeding in just one of our classes makes you 20% more likely to graduate, not just in ethnic studies. If you're a business major or a science major, and these folks then go out and they're not just knowing science, they're knowing why they do science in order to serve themselves and to serve people. When you give meaning to life, and ethnic studies is not the only way to do it, there are other pedagogies to do it, but when you teach people to understand the meaning of themselves in relationship to what they do, they will do it in a more just fashion. And that's why I'm very um, humbled by being honored by the NAACP, because the NAACP, of course, is our anchor for social justice. Right. And it was founded by a number of educators. Absolutely. So I'm, um, I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us and for and just letting us know that really education, just education is the key. Being knowledgeable of self and knowledgeable of, of others. others. And having that be truthful yes. and humane. Absolutely. And applied to the lives of real people in real time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for talking to me. It was nice oh, meeting very you good and meeting congratulations you. Thank you. again. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Okay. Enjoy. Have a good evening. I'm honored to actually have sitting here Mr. Vincent Matthews, who is the superintendent of schools. Mr. Matthews, could you just tell the viewers a little bit more about yourself and what it is you do exactly? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> kind of hard. Uh, my name is Vincent Matthews. I am the superintendent of the San Francisco Unified School District. And uh, my job is to make sure that uh, each and every day we provide quality instruction and equitable support so that our students will be able to thrive in the 21st century. So I'm uh, in charge of the entire district. Uh, we have 56,000 students, 140 schools, and my job is to work for a school board and uh, make sure those schools are operating uh, at the highest level that they can. Awesome, and a question, because um, I know as far as charter schools, are you in charge of charter schools or is that public school education? So charter schools are actually public schools. Okay. Uh, but it depends on if they are authorized by the district. There are some charters that come to us and we authorize them and so they fall under our umbrella. Okay. Uh, other charters uh, are, um, they, we, if we don't authorize them, the state authorizes them okay. and then that, the state is who they actually end up Report reporting to. to. Yes. As superintendent of schools, mm -hmm. I know you mentioned um, charter schools. Could you just kind of explain the difference between perhaps charter schools that fall under you, under the public education system, and charter schools that might fall under the state sanction that you mentioned, charter schools? Because I know for me, I find it a little bit confusing why the disconnect or the discord between charter schools and public schools. And I know I'm not the only one. There's got to be other people out there that don't understand what the issue is between when you say charter school and some people are like, they're totally against it. So if you can just maybe under explain the relationship or where the disconnect is. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think it's as much a disconnect mm -hmm. as there is uh, 
basically controversy for some around charter schools. Okay. And what it is is that a charter school, what happens is they ask for, uh, they come to us and they will write a charter saying, we want to run the school in this way. Okay. And so uh, if we agree with them, then they're running it separate from the district or in a different way than the district runs schools. Mm -hmm. uh, what some people say though is that the problem is, or the controversy comes when the charter schools uh, begin to accept students. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if they accept all students and don't remove any students, then most people don't have a, a problem. But it's when charter schools, um, if students suddenly disappear from the school or somehow are removed from the school, but then the charter schools continue to compare themselves to us, as they'll say, look at our scores, look at how our students are mass showing that they're mastering skills compared to your students, and where people get upset or angry, um, or there's a controversy, is, is it's like comparing uh, oranges to apples, if you, because we can't just remove students, uh, but many people, what the thought is, is that charters, if they don't kick students out, what they do is they um, help counsel students out, and that's where the controversy comes, and that's where many people are upset. They say, if you're going to counsel students out, then you can't, it, it, you shouldn't be comparing yourselves to us, because we can't do that. Got it. Okay, that clears up a lot, because I think, I know I can't be the only one trying to understand what the issue is, or what issue some people take up with charter schools. Now I have a better understanding. So, in terms of um, the public school system, what is your vision, or, or kind of where is the San Francisco School District? Where are you guys going? What's right. your vision? How are you preparing this generation of students for jobs that are going to exist 10 years down the road and right. not for the ones that right. are being extinct right now? Right. And, and, and that's a difficulty for any school system. It's actually we're preparing students for jobs that don't exist today. Absolutely. Uh, so it's looking not only down the road, but looking around the corner. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we believe, as I said, is our mission as a district is that we are, for each and every student, for each and every day, what we're trying to provide is quality instruction and equitable support mm -hmm. so that each and every one of those students can thrive in the 21st century. Right. Uh, when we think about the 21st century, we're thinking about certain skill set that these students need. And the way we're trying to prepare them is that we're trying to make sure they have good communication skills, that's both orally and verbally. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to make sure that they have critical thinking skills. Uh, that they're creative. Um, we want to make sure that students, when you think about technology, it's it's not just having the technology or having access to the technology, which is important, mm -hmm. but also it's how you use that, that technology. Absolutely. Are you using it in a critical way? Um, are you using it to communicate across the world, across different languages? So we're preparing students for a 21st century, and, and the, that, the last skill that we think is so important is that they're creative, because that's the skill, I believe, that is around that flexibility. Right. Uh, when you think about the auto industry and how so many workers ended up losing jobs, it was, it was because there was a lack of flexibility and a lack of ability to switch as the world switches. Right. So we're trying to make sure they have the skill that um, gives them long range forecasting, but also a creativity that they, when they see changes coming, they can adapt to those changes. Got it, that's yeah. great, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and for talking to me and just giving us all a better understanding of how you're preparing our children for the future and for clearing up how public schools, charter schools. So thank you. Have a great evening. I know the event is starting, so I'm going to let you go. Thank you for sitting down. Thank you so and much. I appreciate evening. it. I'm sitting here with Dr. Amos Brown, the president of the San Francisco chapter of the NAACP. And Dr. Brown, I wanted to know, the work of the NAACP is as relevant now as it was over 100 years ago when you guys were founded. And that was primarily to get a handle on or to um, alleviate a lot of the mass lynchings that were happening all over the U.S., but primarily in the South. So what, um, what are some of the initiatives, the current initiatives that the NAACP is working on? We are continuing as a struggle to fight injustice which is in the DNA of this nation. And the racism that was stamped from the beginning, to use the words of Dr. Kendi, the thing of treating blacks unjustly, wrongly, lynchings, came from the crazy, silly notion that we were inferior, that we were not human, and could not master self-governance. The NACP has been about rights, yes, but more importantly, to make sure that we are respected. That's what Aretha Franklin said in her song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. 
So we have sought to gain respect for the black people of this nation since 1909 in order that we might have quality education, that we might have fair opportunities for housing, economic empowerment, jobs, and respect for our culture, and not seeing us as being descendants from the S-holes, as that man who's at 1600 so ignorantly elected to call us, those of us who are from the Caribbean islands and from Africa. So the struggle goes on. It's still here, and we have a resurgence of it because Mr. Trump has given the signal and has stirred up the alt-right. It all comes from an attitude and what's in the heart. And this man has nothing but contempt for black people and is only concerned about materialism, militarism, and racism. Thank you. And one more question. You uh, talked about the resurgence of violence against black people primarily. Um, and there are movements that have kind of come around that the Black Lives Matter, some of the other movements. What I want to know, because the NAACP is a well-respected organization that's been around for over 100 years, and you have a proven track record of success. What I want to know is, how can we bridge the gap between some of the younger organizations, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, with the NAACP, an organization that's well-respected and that's been around and ha that has a proven track record? How can the two of these organizations work together because it, we're fighting for some of the same things. We must work in together. It's not optional. Right. In Mississippi, where I came from, there's an old adage that you never hook up two young mules to ply by themselves. Absolutely. Neither do you hook up two old mules right. to ply by themselves. You always hook up an old mule and a young mule if you want to have successful plowing. And I think that all we need to do is just hook up with each other. Absolutely. No one has all the answers. We must see that this movement has always been intergenerational. I organized the first youth council of NACP at the age of 14 in my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. Wow after, unfortunately, Emmett Till was murdered. And I went to Mr. Mega Evers, whose image is on this program tonight, and told him how upset I was about what those two white men did to Emmett Till, who was the same age as I was then. And he said to me, Amos, don't just be mad. Be smart. Let's organize a youth council so we will be able to teach your young friends how to fight this evil of racism and injustice in a smart way. Absolutely. And in 1956, Mr. Evers brought me to the National Convention of NACP here in San Francisco, wow. where I first met Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who parenthetically, let me say, was my teacher. He taught only one class in his lifetime. And I was one of the eight students at Morehouse College in 1962. Well, I came to that convention, and I met Dr. King. He spoke for Youth Night. He was only 26 years old when he began to lead this movement for justice. And I met A. Phil Randolph, a great labor man, Walter Ruther, the AFL-CIO, Roy Wilkins, who was then the executive secretary of the organization. So personally, I can say, I've always had respect for my elders. And I never felt that I knew it all. Right. I hung around them, I went to the meetings, and I made sure that I was able to extract from their conversations and from their presence those virtues and those principles awesome. that would enable us to fight this demon of race in America awesome. in a smart way.
like that. Thank you. That's I like the way that I like that analogy. You don't plow with the old mule, two old mules and yeah. two young mules. I yeah. like that because the younger mule needs the wisdom yeah. of the old mule, right. and the old mule obviously needs the strength right. of yeah. the younger mule. And that's a great analogy for the Young Black Lives Matter movement and the NAACP. I see the two, one old and wise, one young and strong. You yeah. both need each other. So I hope that in the near future we will see more collaboration and working together because we're all fighting for the same thing, and that's civil rights. And all so we must remember, old folks don't have monopoly on truth and wisdom. Right. Jesus was only 33 years old. Absolutely. Dr. King was only 26, as I said earlier. Absolutely. But what we must see is that it's more of a likelihood that those who've been in the struggle a long time mm -hmm. have a longer perspective and deeper understanding Right. of the ways of this system right. so that we must complement each other Absolutely. and work as a dream team. I like that. Thank you so much. You thank heard you. that we must work as a dream team. I would like to thank you, Dr. Amos. Thank, thank you, you for the work for the that you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the community. And thank you for having us out. And I wish you well. I know this is going to be a lovely event. Thank well, you. We're looking forward to it. Tonight. Awesome. Thank you again. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Rightful freedoms were once denied on this perilous fight. Marching through streets, holding each other's hands oh so tight. Thankful to those who did earn right to earn us the rights to fight the good fight in these historically well-fought fights. Grateful for those who did a mighty work with all their might who depended on Almighty to help them not lose sight. Faithful martyrs who were the light that shined oh so bright, dedicated to sacrificing their lives as lighthouse beacons of light. Hopeful for a better tomorrow to reach the higher heights, checking the ballot to exercise our right on all election nights. Bountiful blessings from those who united with enlightened insight to not ignite nor incite violence, but respectfully requested an invite.